go into the world and tell every man that you meet there is a man on the cross a catholic take what you need to know right now a bold synthesis of inspiration and information keeping you up to date on the news and issues from a courageous catholic perspective a Catholic Take with Joe McLean starts now. All right, but we're, hopefully we're good to go today, but we're going to cover all these stories today. We're going to be talking about all these stories and more today on the program, so sit back and relax, but we'll put links in the show notes over at thestationofthecross.com forward slash ACT. Let's pray Let's begin. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thine intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O Virgin of virgins, my mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, and now your saint of the day. Edmund Campion was born to a Catholic bookseller of the same name in London in 1540. A talented student, he was still a schoolboy when he was selected to give a Latin address to Queen Mary Tudor when she arrived in London. He went on to attend Oxford, where he impressed everyone with his scholarly talents, considered to rank among the greatest the university has ever seen. The Protestant Queen Elizabeth offered him any position he desired, and the dazzled Campion took the oath of supremacy and became an Anglican deacon. He soon had second thoughts, however, and his guilt drove him to Ireland, where he attempted to hide from suspicions regarding his true loyalty. He eventually returned to England in disguise and observed the trial of Blessed John Story, one of Oxford's first Catholic martyrs. Story's example inspired Campion to take the final step back to the faith, and he fled to the English Catholic College at Douai in France. After reconciling, to the, after reconciling with the church and stud, studying theology, Campion made a barefoot pilgrimage to Rome to enter the Society of Jesus and was ordained a Jesuit priest in Prague in 1578. After a vision of Our Lady foretelling his martyrdom, Campion made his way back to England where he ministered to underground Catholics and sought to make converts until a spy finally betrayed his location. After a long sham trial, during which Campion ran intellectual rings against his persecutors, the holy priest and others were sentenced to death. He was hanged, drawn, and quartered on November on December 1, 1581, with his noble witness prompting many conversions in the crowd. One young man, Henry Walpole, became a Jesuit and martyr himself after Campion's blood stained his white shirt. Campion was canonized in 1970 by Pope St. John Paul, St. Paul VI as one of the 40 martyrs of England and Wales. St. Edward Campion, pray for us. And now your headline news. CNA is reporting pending decision by human rights court threatens legal to legalize abortion throughout Latin America. The Inter-American Court of Human Rights is deliberating a case that has the potential to legalize abortion throughout Latin America. The abortion lobby has seized on the case of Beatriz, a Salvadorian woman who was seriously ill and pregnant with a fatally disabled child who died shortly after birth. If the Inter-American Court gives in to pressure from abortion groups, the practice could be required throughout the continent Since although the sentences issued by the court are mandatory for the OAS member states, but uh, it's not sure whether that will actually force it upon all of the countries of Latin America. So look out for that. The Hill reports Hamas releases two more hostages. Hamas released two more hostages on Thursday as the Palestinian militant organization and Israel agreed to extend a temporary ceasefire by another day. The Israeli government identified the two hostages released Thursday as 21-year-old Mia Shem and 40-year-old Ahmet Susana. 
Over 200 Palestinian prisoners held in Israel, all women and teenagers, have been released in exchange for the hostages. Israel has vowed to resume the offensive in Gaza after the ceasefire ends, although they are facing international pressure to limit civilian casualties and better support the hundreds of thousands of civilians displaced from their homes. Catholic Vote is reporting FBI dragged Catholic family from home at gunpoint over a 15-year-old son's memes. The FBI reportedly used force to remove a traditionalist Catholic family from their home and placed them in a locked van after the 15-year-old son posted, quote, offensive memes, close quote, online. The boy's father alleged that his minor son had fallen into a trap set by the FBI as a part of their exposed targeting of so-called, quote, radical traditional Catholics, close quote. And uh, don't forget to check out the link in the description and the show notes uh, about that story. And those, those are your headline news. The gospel today comes to us from Luke chapter 21, verses 29 through 33. Jesus told his disciples a parable. Consider the fig tree and all the other trees. When their buds burst open, you see for yourselves and know that summer is now near. In the same way, when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. Amen, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. The Ignatius Catholic Study Bible would say, The short parable of the fig tree advocates constant prayer and readiness. Disciples must be alert at all times, lest they grow lazy in their pursuit of holiness. Tribulations are inevitable before the dramatic onset of God's judgment and the coming of his kingdom. We may not know the day or the hour, but we must know the signs be able to read them and act appropriately when we do see these signs. And uh, the Catholic commentary on Holy Scripture wants us to back up one verse. If you go back to Luke chapter 21, verse 28, or chapter 21, verse 28, it says, Now when these things begin to take place, look up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. So that's just the, the first verse right before today's gospel begins. And then the commentary says, Jesus distinguishes between the parousia and the coming of the kingdom of God, which in some way is already in you or among you. Note also the distinction between they shall see of verse 27 and look up and lift up your heads of verse 28. There is a break in thought. The redemption in verse 28 may be taken as the liberation of the disciples from the restraining bonds of Judaism, which are not only the persecutions proceeding from the synagogue, but also the hindrances arising from the Judaizers among the convert Jews, of which Luke will write in the book of Acts. I think it's a very uh, good distinction, especially if you go back and read the letter to the Hebrews. You'll see that there were many that were being led astray, going back to animal uh, sacrifice in the temple. And its destruction in 70 AD put an end once and for all, for all of that. And that is what's being hinted at, as well as the end of time and the judgment of individuals and all nations here in this gospel passage. The commentary goes on to say, the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple solved both of these problems and provided the occasion for the spread of the kingdom of God throughout the world. The thing foreseen by the prophets, Isaiah chapter 2, for instance, chapter 65, chapter 66, Malachi 1, etc., When they already shoot forth with the leaves, not fruit, you know by looking at them that summer is already nigh. So you also, consequently, it is not a question of the parousia, but of something the disciples, some of them at least, will live to see, something the date of which can be roughly fixed, therefore the ruin of the city. So the the commentary is pointing out that this is a foreshadowing of the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, which, by the way, in 70 AD, when the temple is destroyed and the city is destroyed and a million people are slaughtered, the blood ran as thick as a river there in Jerusalem, 
The, the Christians, of course, saw that coming when Trajan's army shows up and you see the signs in the heavens and the, uh, the angelic forces in battle array and you hear the voices in the temple. They knew those, these were the signs of the times. They didn't know the day or the hour. They just packed up and left. And that is because Jesus warned them ahead of time. But when the temple is being destroyed in 70 AD, you know what other temple is being destroyed almost at the same time? The temple of Jupiter in Rome is being destroyed. Someone threw a, uh, a fire brand into the temple in Jupiter in Rome, and it burned down. So you have these two temples almost burning at the same time, coming to their destruction. This is not only judgment upon this, but it's the fulfillment of it too. The time of Christmas, the blood seed of the martyrs planted in Rome will come to its ripe and full harvest when Constantine is baptized, and then furthermore, when the church takes over the governance of the Roman Empire. It's fascinating. We explore that theme in an upcoming documentary film produced by the station across iCatholic Radio Films, and that's going to be coming out hopefully in the next few weeks. So be sure to be on our email list for that. But don't go anywhere. Coming up after the break, I want to share with you a horrific story of satanic abortion. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Tech, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. It's great to be on with you. Coming up at uh, 30 past the hour, we're going to have a conversation with Jim Havens, the host of The Simple Truth, heard all across the Station of Cross Catholic Media Network, 4 p.m. Monday through Friday in his program. And today, coming up in just a few minutes, we're going to talk not only about the great debate between two governors, the governor of California and the governor of Florida. What did they talk about? It's kind of fire. kind of reminded me of like a high school cafeteria. I mean, it's juvenile. But nonetheless, we'll catch up on that. But I also want to talk about, uh, you know, what did Pope Francis say about the church is women? Uh, we need to understand the theology of women. I thought JP2 did that already. Uh, I don't know. We're going to get Jim Havens to weigh in on those stories for you coming up at 30 past there do join us if you can but there are lots of stories in the news that are of great concern to me and i'm sure they are to you as well here's one you might be interested in cosmopolitan magazine cosmopolitan magazine they apparently i don't know if it's an ad or if it's an article or what but they are promoting satanic abortion ritual oh yeah i'm going to link to the to the story for you in the show notes over at the station of the cross.com forward slash ACT. Talk about women. You want to understand the theology of women? Well, well let's start right here. Uh, I saw this tweet from Ashley Hayek. It says, uh, Cosmo just posted, quote, how to get a satanic abortion, close quote. This mocks the sanctity of motherhood and Christianity. It's disgusting that a mainstream magazine that claims to empower young women would serve this sick content, close quote. Let me just read the, let me read this. I guess it's an ad. I gu- I'm guessing that's what we're talking about here, an ad in Cosmopolitan. Let me just read the ad to you, just to give you some idea here. So how does a satanic abortion ceremony even work? The picture is of a woman's hand holding up a broken piece of mirrored glass, and she's seeing her the reflection of her eye in the mirror. So that's that's the image. It's all in red. Very, uh, you know, satanic, diabolic overtones going on here. So how does a satanic abortion even work? Patients of all faiths are welcome at Samuel Alito's mom's satanic abortion clinic in New Mexico. (laughs) I mean, I chuckle, but I mean, how juvenile do we have to get here? I guess we're talking about the occult and the diabolic, Joe. So, all right, well, then I guess it comes comes with the territory. They named... This satanic abortion mill in a way to throw jabs at Samuel Alito. Why? Because he, you know, his decision helped to overturn Roe v. Wade. So he's throwing, a, they're throwing a jab, naming the clinic after his mom because his mom could have gotten an abortion. She didn't, praise be to God. And she was against abortion, praise be to God. But nonetheless, that's what we're dealing with. The ad goes on to say, along with medical counsel, TST offers free ceremonial support to everyone ceremonial support abortion ceremonies are totally optional and customizable here's a simple one that the satanic temple recommends quote first find a quiet space bring a mirror if you can 
just before taking the medication, gaze at your reflection and focus on your personhood. Home in on your intent. I I think they mean hone, but home in. I wonder if they're going to get emails about that. I get emails about regardless or irregardless, but I wonder if they're going to get emails on home in versus hone in. I don't know. Anyway, the Satanist says home in on your intent, your responsibility to you. And then it has them make some sort of like a a weird, um, like a, oh yeah, here it is. This is, this is what they want you to say. It says later, once the procedure is complete, return to your reflection, focus again on your personhood, your power in making this decision. Complete the ritual by reciting a personal affirmation by my body, my blood, by my will, it is done. You know what I thought of when I, when I read that the first time this morning? By the way, that's an article I'm going to be linking to in the show notes from the Catholic Vote, catholicvote.org. Women's Magazine promotes satanic ritual abortions. We're going to put it in the show notes at the stationofthecross.com forward slash ACT. You can find the show notes linked up right there. But uh, when I thought about that, I thought about how our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, before he was hung on a cross in a garden, nailed to the tree, becoming the fruit of of life for us in the Holy Eucharist. I thought about how he was, uh, you know, in his one and only election, and he lost the vote. In fact, the entire crowd not only voted against him and voted for Barabbas, the son of the father. That's what Barabbas means, the son of the father. Instead of the the real and actual son of the father, they voted for a fake son of the father, a false son of the father, an anti-son of the father. Let that sink in for a moment. But then but then they made a blood pact, just something very similar to what I just read to you in this abortion ritual published by the Satanic Church, the Satanic Temple, who owns an abortion mill in New Mexico, and then has it promoted in the Cosmopolitan magazine. That level of insanity, that level is so insane to me. Similar to our conversation yesterday with Michael Hitchborn about giving donor dollars through CCHD to an organization that literally prayed to to demons in a altar they had set up in their office. We've given them money to the tune of over six figures. Hard-earned donor dollars went to that cause. Whew. Absolutely bizarre. Now, let me give you some, some contrast to that. I also saw in this morning an article over at the Angelus. Again, we're, we'll link to everything, angelusnews.com. Why did Jesus call his mother woman? Dr. Scott Hahn. It's a short article. It's very simple. He points to John's gospel, to that garden where a tree was set up, and on that tree was nailed our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's, the Calvary is described as a garden. He's buried there, very close front, uh, to there, as we all know, uh, from history, archaeology, and from Scripture, that our Lord and Savior was was buried very close in the tomb, a garden tomb right next to Calvary. And on that tree hung our Lord and Savior, the fruit of life, the Holy Eucharist. And at the foot of that tree was the woman, the woman. He called her woman at Cana. He calls her woman at Calvary. Dr. Hahn says, but his use, meaning John's use of the word, also echoes the first book of the Bible. There, woman is the name of Adam gives to Eve, Genesis 2.23. Jesus then is addressing Mary as Eve to the new Adam, which heightens the significance of the wedding feast that they're attending, whose historical bride and groom are never married. Woman redefines not only Mary's relationship with Jesus, but also with the with all believers. When Jesus gave her over to the beloved disciple, in effect, He gave her to all his beloved disciples of all time, like Eve, whom Genesis 3.20 calls mother of all the living. Mary is mother to all who have new life in baptism. Let that sink in. Again, we're going to link to this, but I want to I want to take us to the apocalypse. Revelation chapter 12. This is one of I think this has got to be my favorite nativity description in, in sacred scripture. Oh, yeah, it's absolutely on par with Luke, Luke 1, with Matthew. You can have another nativity passage in the Bible by just going to Revelation chapter 12, the Apocalypse chapter 12. 
and you see a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. And being with child, she cried, travailing in birth, and was in pain to be delivered, to bring forth the Savior. It goes on. And there was seen another sign in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his head seven diadems, and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and cast them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to be delivered, that when she should be delivered, he might devour her son. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with an iron rod, and her son was taken up to God and to his throne. You see in this cosmic battle between the woman, her child, and this dragon. This dragon is the great Nahash, the ancient serpent, the scriptures tell us, the ancient serpent of Genesis. So don't think every time you read Genesis chapter 3 of a little garden snake and an apple hanging from a tree. No, no, we're talking dragon, the great Nahash, and he is threatening this woman. But there is nothing in common between these two characters in the book of the Apocalypse. In fact, there's nothing this dragon can do to even upset this woman. He can have no impact whatsoever on this woman. He can't touch her. He can't harm her. He can't fault her. He can't do anything to her. And she remains silent. The Eve in in Genesis chapter 3, in a garden, by a tree, does all of the negotiations with the great Nahash. And guess what happens? We fall. There's the great fall. Fall from grace. So Eve, the mother of all the living, all of her children have this now fallen nature. But this new Eve, whom our Lord calls woman in a garden at the foot of a tree, this new woman, she remains utterly silent. Now let's go to chapter 12, verse 17. And the dragon was angry against the woman and went to make war with the rest of her seed, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Are you a part of the woman's seed? I'm talking about the new woman, the woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars on her head, who crushes the head of Satan, because it would be her seed in Genesis that would crush the head of Satan. And I think this is a clear contrast of what we're dealing with here. The satanic temple is attacking women, twisting and perverting what women really is, what it means to be a woman, to bring forth life, to be, to, to be this incredible, amazing vessel through which life is brought forth on planet Earth. Sacred, holy, amazing. The greatest evangelist in the history of the church, the greatest creature ever to be created by God is a woman. And somehow, some way, our culture today has twisted and perverted what it means to be woman. Somehow we have, the, we have this sense of shame for being male, the shame for being woman, as if the two don't complement each other, as if Holy Mother Church has never even spoken on this issue. Of course, of course it has. But I don't know about you, but I can tell you, I certainly put myself in the category of being of the children of this woman, the rest of her seed, who keep the commandments of God, at least I attempt to. And when I fall, guess what I do? I cry out with loud cries and lamentations to the one who is able to save me. Well, how do you do that, Joe? Well, you go to confession. You go to confession. You make your confession. You cry out. And he hears you. When you make your good confession, he absolves you. Through the voice box of the priest who is in persona Christi on the other side of that screen. But have no doubt that it is the woman standing at the foot of the tree, nailed upon which is the fruit of life itself. It is her intercession to be silent there, to watch her son die on a cross so that you might have salvation. She brought forth the Savior of mankind so that you might be saved. Let us reject the world's version of womenhood and what it means to be woman and embrace the true femininity. Let us embrace Christ himself and the mother of all the living, our lady, and reject Satan, the world of flesh and the devil. Pray 
Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean, and here are your headline news. The Daily Wire reports, singer who filmed provocative music video in Catholic Church issues flippant response to controversy. Pop star Sabrina Carpenter drew criticism earlier this month with the release of her music video for Feather. The video, which includes provocative dancing, skimpy outfits, and death-related imagery, including fake blood, was filmed inside Our Lady of Mount Carmel of the Annunciation Catholic Church in Brooklyn. As a result, Monsignor Jamie Gigliantilio, or Gigantilio had been relieved of his administrative duties. Now, the 24-year-old singer who was uh, on tour with Taylor Swift for several months shared a few thoughts about the controversy, saying basically, quote, well, we got the approval in advance, close quote. However, Monsignor told the New York Times that the video was not what was initially presented to him after he approved the filming. He said, however, that he wanted to do it because he thought it would bring the young people in his parish closer because they're very creative, apparently. So there you go, folks. Breitbart reports hazmat suited big white men return to disinfect China as pneumonia grips the nation. Taiwan Ministry of Health and Welfare on Thursday advised young and elderly citizens and those with weak immune systems to avoid traveling to China during the surge of respiratory illness. The Chinese government continues to insist that it has the outbreak under control, but observes recently Notice that the return of travel restrictions are back. Spraying public areas with disinfectant is back. Techniques Beijing mastered during the coronavirus pandemic. Chinese doctors told the Global Times that they see no evidence of a novel pathogen like the Wuhan coronavirus in the current outbreak. Just a surge of microplasma pneumonia, which they portrayed as lingering hangovers from the coronavirus lockdowns, which have spread throughout the world because... I know a lot of people who are struggling with that very thing right now. And CNA is reporting Nicaraguan regime publishes photos of imprisoned bishop. In response to demands for proof that the bishop, Bishop Rolando Alvarez, is still alive, the Nicaraguan dictatorship Ministry of the Interior released new images of the prelate. Alvarez was sentenced to 26 years and four months in prison in February, accused, accused of being a, quote, traitor, to his homeland, close quote. And those, those are your headline news. Let's pray for the bishop in Nicaragua. I mean, very heroic, very courageous man, praise be to God. He could have left. They gave, they gave him a chance. He chose not to. He chose to stay. Let that sink in. Uh, what a heroic and courageous man. Uh, but joining us right now is uh, Jim Havens, host of The Simple Truth. You can hear it weekdays, 4 p.m. Eastern time, across the station, across Catholic Media Network, covering a variety of topics of living the faith, living life, being pro-life, being courageous, and so much more. Check them out at the station of the cross dot com. But Jim Havens, good morning to you. Welcome and thank you good, for being on. Yeah, good morning, Joe. Great to be with you today. Glad to have you on the team. Let's talk about the big debate first. I want to jump into the the, the Pope's comments on masculinity and and femininity. But before we do that, there was a big debate. There was a big debate last night between uh, Governor Ron DeSantis. And Governor Gavin Newsom. So uh, I don't know. Are you able to hear me right now, Jim? I can. Okay. Yeah, I'm hearing you. a little bit of echo in my uh, headphones, but I'm all right. <laughs> well, I'm going to let you take the headphones off so you can just talk. But what was your assessment of the de- big debate between Newsom and DeSantis last night? Yes. Well, the first thing is is that it's a it's a mess to go ahead and watch that. But uh, at the same time, I guess my uh, evaluation would be that um, I thought DeSantis. He had some strengths and weaknesses. I would say his strength was he did a good job um, just explaining that uh, every time he had the chance, hey, this guy is uh, he, he's he's slick and he's uh, he's trying to pull one over on you. And he, he might uh, he might look good in the way that he's trying to present things, which is a strength of Gavin Newsom uh, to many that uh, he is quite deceptive in, in a sort of uh, charm that he brings across. But. Obviously, he is pushing some uh, great evils, the governor of uh, California, abortion, uh, the, the the ongoing daily mass murder of our little ones to the full. This guy's full bore on it. And when that topic came up, um, that's where we actually saw, I think, DeSantis, um, his greatest weakness. And this is something we've been following um, for quite a while. 
He really doesn't know how to speak to the topic of abortion. Most Republicans don't, sadly, at this time. And the pro-life leadership, I think, has failed them in giving them a, a way to be able to um, to really push forward politically at this time and to win. Yeah, there was a lot of, I would say, juvenile debate between the two of them. Kind of, you know, stepping all over each other. You'd be just being juvenile, in my opinion. It's like, it like a high school cafeteria thing going on. And uh, I thought it was kind of funny, though. I did kind of laugh when uh, DeSantis told the story of a guy leaving California because it's so bad there. And it was hard to get a U-Haul in, uh, in California. Just so you can leave. They didn't want to let the U-Hauls leave the state because so many were leaving. Turns out that that was Governor DeSantis' father-in-law, I thought. That was a pretty good jab, for sure. But just in general, it's like... There's no there's no civility in the in the dialogue. There's no civility in the debate. You can't it's like they, they pose this as like an opportunity to have substantive conversation. I don't know. I didn't see substantive conversation. I just saw bantering and battling. What did you see? Yeah, there wasn't a whole lot of substance. I thought it was kind of clever what Sean Hannity was doing. And uh, I'm not a big fan of Hannity. His abortion stance is uh, is pretty weak. And um, and he's got some weaknesses himself, but I thought he did a fine job in terms of saying, hey, I'm going to be the moderator here. I'm going to try to do it down the middle. I'm not uh, I'm, I'm not going to try to favor DeSantis, even though my politics would. But um, I'm going to put up some graphics. And when he put up those graphics and he said, look, I'm just going to state the facts, all of those graphics one after another throughout the debate, it just showed the facts that things are many in many ways going very well in Florida and going very poorly in California. And um, there's really no place to hide from those facts. And so he would just kind of put those up there and Newsom would deflect and try to switch to something else and give his own uh, statistics that he was kind of just pulling out of nowhere. And that gave DeSantis the opportunity to just say, hey, he's not answering the question. The the graphic was up there. The fact was there. So that was giving some substance to the viewer to just see the statistics right before them and then to watch how uh, uh, Newsom was – uh, reacting to that. So I thought that that was helpful. Um, but again, when the topic of abortion came up, uh, there was no statistics, no graphic, nothing like that. Hannity just kind of presented it up there. And um, and it was one that, as expected, Newsom um, pretty much destroyed DeSantis on because DeSantis is running away from his own position that he has held as Florida governor. Um, and uh, and it's a weak point for DeSantis. He doesn't know how to handle it. We've tried to reach out to his uh, him in, in many ways throughout uh, the last couple of years. I'm a resident of Florida. He's my governor down there. Um, but there is no receptivity. They think they, uh, I guess, are fine on this issue and they're getting destroyed on it. Oh, wow. That's it's so sad to see. They, they don't support they don't defend marriage between a man and a woman. And and when it comes to the abortion issue, something you said a minute ago is they get very weak and they. And he doesn't even know what to do. He keeps backtracking. Trump put so much pressure on him, and that was something Gavin Newsom really laid into him. You're forty, you're forty points behind and behind Trump, Ron. How's that working out for you? That was a pretty, pretty good dig right there. But nonetheless, why don't you think conservatives are conserving marriage, and why aren't conservatives conserving uh, personhood, the right to life at conception in the womb? Yeah, because a lot of people with the conservative label are at the core quite immoral. And these are serious moral problems, moral um, moral failings, serious sins. When we're talking about um, homosexuality, and we're talking about uh, pretending that uh, that marriage can be between two men or two women, these are lies. These are evils. When we're talking about the ongoing daily mass murder of human beings, our littlest children in the womb, our littlest brothers and sisters, um, they should have a clear moral voice on this. They should be conserving the truth on this and proclaiming it to the full. Sadly, they have lost it at the core. And so, look, where are the conservative leaders? There should be folks with a conservative uh, political identity that are stepping forward and being bold in these ways. But it just seems like there there are none left. There aren't certainly any um, in, in the political field right now in this run up to the 2024 election. They've caved on um, on both of those serious issues, and it's sad to see it. And I guess they're just hoping to uh, to make it to the general, and when they get into the general election, just say, hey, I'm better than the other guy. You know, we get funneled into these one of two categories. We're never usually allowed to have that middle ground too often, but, you know, you're either, you're either 100% in this team or you're 100% in that team, and you got to go along with whatever that team wants, no matter what. You, if you're in that category, you got to go with the whole, the whole thing. 
And I reject that as a Catholic because we need to defend marriage. We need to defend personhood. We need to defend what we believe to be true, irregardless of where you're from or what creed you, you profess or, or what your personal biases are or anything else. These things are true for all human beings because they're natural law. And yet, uh, not only is the church pressure pushing us into one of these two categories, but societal pressure. How do we break out of that? How do we find that middle ground and stand on the truth of Jesus Christ, his, his one holy Catholic and apostolic church, and let the chips fall where they may in a world that doesn't want to seem seemingly allow that in or out of the church? Yeah, we have to first acknowledge the reality of it, exactly what you're saying. This is true. And so why why would we not be holding to what is true? We need to repent and believe to whatever degree we are not. We need to um, stand up for the truth, and we need to live it to the full, proclaim it to the full. And these are reasonable positions. These are utterly reasonable positions. There are easy ways to explain these positions to people, and that should be the effort going forward. But again, yeah, people don't have their eye on the ball here. But it wouldn't be that hard if people um, would simply want to get reoriented, get their eye on the ball, and start uh, moving in the right direction. But, yeah, it takes a, a personal uh, conversion of heart and mind, I think, at the core. And then um, and then leadership is what we need. Okay, so last thought on this debate from the governors last night. Uh, clearly, Governor Newsom is setting himself up for a presidential run. That's how I took that. I think most people thought that that's the case. And it's certainly been the speculation, the rumor, because but he but he also touted uh, Biden's uh, track record. And he really, you know, tried to lift that up in in opposition to Governor DeSantis. But do you think Governor Newsom is going to make the run for the White House? And do you think he has a chance if so? Well, I, I, I don't know about 2024. It seems like there are a growing number of people in Biden's own orbit that are saying, hey, the, the way it's time to it's time to eject before it's too late. It's not looking good for you. It seems like personally he and his wife, they want to keep moving forward. So I think it's going to come down to a decision by Joe Biden himself and his and his wife and if they're going to continue on or not. But I think there is a growing pressure on him within his own party, within his own supporters to step aside. And if he does, then it's going to be very interesting because I think there's going to be a civil war within the the Democratic Party between those who want to go with Newsom, those who want to go with uh, Kamala Harris, and to watch that play out and all of the identity politics around it uh, will be quite interesting. But if he's the nominee, um, look, he is a slick fellow that uh, a lot of people uh, fall to, to his wiles and charms and and think what he's saying is true and, and want to go that direction. So. Yeah, if he's the nominee, there's a chance he could be uh, elected in 2024. God help us. Yeah, exactly. God help us. We're talking with Jim Havens from The Simple Truth. It's a great program. You can listen to it at 4 p.m. Eastern all across the Station of the Cross. We're right up against a break, but Jim, I, I want to make that transition to the Pope and his comments. Uh, he's got this uh, statement, and it, I don't know, it just kind of bugged me, I would say. I'm sure it bugged a lot of other people. I'll put a link to the story. Let me just set this up before the break, and then we'll come back and get your comments on that. Pope Francis, the church is woman. Uh, this is an article, ACI Stampa and uh, EW10. It says, this Thursday, November the 30th, Pope Francis received members of the International Theological Commission, the Vatican, where he reminded them that the church is female and a bride. Okay, great. The organism was, the organism was established by Paul VI, with then Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith in 1969, blah, 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 blah. Due to suffering from a lung inflammation that it impedes his normal breathing, the pontiff handed over his speech, which was read by somebody else. But here's the deal. He says, the Pope criticized the scant presence of women in the commission. We must progress. We must progress on this. Women have a different capacity for theological reflection than men. At the next meeting of the nine cardinals, we will reflect on the female dimension of the church. The church is female, Francis reiterated. And if we do not understand what a woman is, what the theology of a woman is, we will never understand what the church is. One of our great sins has been masculinizing, 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 I guess that's, is that a word? Masculinizing the church? And this is not resolved through through ministerial means. We're going to talk about this on the other side of the break with Jim Havens from The Simple Truth. So don't go anywhere. A Catholic Take will be right back. Pray 
Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. So good to be on with you. Top of the hour, we'll say goodbye to the radio audience. We'll stay on for the live video feed for what we call the after show. It gets a lot more casual. We take your comments, so you get to chime in on anything we talk about. It's a free-for-all, and uh, you can be a part of it. Just go to the stationofthecross.com forward slash ACT. If you want to find a way to be a part of it, what you need to do is get on one of the live video feeds, the station of the cross.com forward slash ACT. If you scroll down, you'll see the live video player. And just underneath that, there are the icons for where you can uh, chime in. So YouTube or, or Facebook or someplace like that, you can comment and we will be happy to interact with you directly during the after show. But we're talking with Jim Havens from The Simple Truth. We're talking about not only the debate last night, you know, there's some big issues that just aren't being handled in a very, you know, sensible, mature, comprehensive, uh, in-depth way at all whatsoever. It's just more of the same. Uh, and this is another story that we're jumping into, and that's Pope Francis, the church is woman. And, you know, I get what he was trying to do here. He's saying, look, you got your organization, your institution – you need more women on the team. That's what he's trying to say. Whether I agree with that is a secondary issue. But ultimately, he drags in like this sentiment, this idea that somehow the church has never contemplated the theology of women. I mean, JPT wrote a huge encyclical on it. He wrote a letter to them in addition to that. You got theology of the body and so much more. So I'm pretty sure the church has commented, thought about, spent a lot of time diving into what it means to be woman and the theology of women. So it's confusing to me, but I want to get Jim's take on this. Jim, welcome back. What do you say about this? Sure. Well, first of all, I think it's good to point out that uh, we've got some amazing female theologians down through the ages, doctors of the church. Uh, St. Teresa of Avila, St. Catherine of Siena, St. Therese of Lisieux, St. Uh, Hildegard of Bingen, and then, uh, you know, St. Teresa Benedicta of the Cross, I think, is uh, one to throw out there, St. Bridget of Sweden. We've got many, I think, in our own time of uh, Alice von Hildebrand. I would recommend people maybe to uh, to go ahead and get some of her books and read what she has to say about uh, the beauty of femininity. And um, And, yeah, so I think what we see here is what we have come to to see a lot of when it comes to Pope Francis, and that is a lot of ambiguity. That is, um, you know, throwing out lines here and there that um, do not on their own sound good at all. In fact, they're quite terrible. Um, when he says we want to make the church less masculine, um, you shouldn't be saying that, right? And now we can look at it in context in the full remarks. And yes, like you're saying, we can understand what he's saying. He seemed to be, these were off-the-cuff remarks after his statement uh, that he made to this theological uh, commission. And uh, in these off-the-cuff remarks, he, he seemed to be bothered by the fact that there were a couple dozen people in the room, theologians, and there was, you know, four or five of them were women. And so he goes off on this uh, on this thing about uh, the, the femininity of the church, which, which yes, look, but hold up the, the vision, the greatest vision of the church among us, which is our blessed mother Mary. I mean, we've got this. You go to the Catechism of the Catholic Church, it says about Mary, by her complete adherence to the Father's will, to his son's redemptive work, to every prompting of the Holy Spirit, the Virgin Mary is the church's model of faith and charity. Thus, she is a preeminent and wholly unique member of the church. Indeed, she is the exemplary realization of of the church. So to try, he, he's falling into kind of this, uh, th this false liberal narrative that the church is somehow like anti woman. It couldn't be further from the truth. And I just don't, it doesn't make sense why he would go on a rant like that. Um, hold up the beauty of the church if you want to talk about this subject and certainly don't tear down masculinity within the church. We need more masculinity within the church, especially among our leaders. When we live in a time where we've got this ongoing daily mass murder of the least of these, our vulnerable, pregnant moms in need, um, our littlest uh, brothers and sisters in the womb. This is the cry of the poor in our time. And we need the leadership of our bishops, of our pope, to be standing against this to the full. This is also an evangelization issue because if other faithful, sincere Christians see that, they're going to say, I want some of that. Why are they so right about this and leading on this? That is what we're called to do. That is what saints 
in this time are called to do. We're all called to be that, to love the least of these, love Jesus in the least of these. He gave us no way out of that. And when this is going on, we ought to see that uh, in the beauty of femininity, in the beauty of masculinity, we all need to stand up and use whatever gifts we have in this time. And one more aspect of this is the spiritual warfare dimension of this. As you were talking about in an earlier segment, this is uh, paramount. And the fact is, is that this is something that the leaders in our church, our pope, our bishops, our priests, there is no substitute for what they can bring in the spiritual warfare needed in our time right now. They should be summoning everybody to pray for an end of this de- demonic mass murder that is taking place by the hundreds of thousands around the world every day. We just act like ho-hum, nothing to see here. Every now and then I'll say something about pro-life or whatever. That is not the right way to respond to this reality before us. We are we are weak. We are desensitized. We need to wake up. And uh, this is on all of us. But I do think that uh, calling for the church to be less masculine in this time is the exact opposite message of what we need. I know. I mean, we don't have to go very far to know that most parishes in America anyway, I don't know what it's like in, in Europe as far as how they're run or whatever. Most parishes in, in America, I mean, like the staff is female for the most part run by the the parish secretary for crying out loud. I mean like I mean it's not that I'm not dissing on the parish secretary. God bless her, God love her. God bless all the pious women who go to church. Where are the men? It's they're not the problem as much as the men. The men are the problem. Where where the where are the men? The men aren't showing up. The men aren't aren't taking le- these leadership roles seriously. We've somehow b- bought into the spirit of the world that says you can't be, uh, you know, content, happy, proud of, uh, you know, okay with your identity as a male or your identity as a female. These things have to be blurred together in some sort of perverse fashion. That's the spirit of the world. Why in the world would we ever want to be? on the side of the spirit of the world when our Lord makes it utterly clear to us that we are to reject the spirit of the world. We are to help those that are, that are uh, buying and, and taking the poison of the spirit of the world to come out of that in order to find salvation. Why? It's just, it feels like this type of language coming out of his holiness leads people to believe and buy into that spirit of the world more than it does. Otherwise that's, that's how I'm taking it. I find it, I find it dangerous, even though he was specifically talking to this specific group about their specific organization and the staff members they might have on team. I mean, you, do you get what I'm saying, Jim? It's, it just seems like this is dangerous. You, you, are, you are pushing people closer to the spirit of this age, the spirit of this world, and that is not a good thing. Right. Yeah. Why not talk about the need for men to step up? Right. He's, he's not saying any of that. But in the beginning of his remarks, well, let, let, let's first yeah address those uh, more off the cuff remarks. One thing I do want to point out that is good in terms of what he said here um, was that uh, you, you quoted it in at, right at the end of that last segment that he did say um, that this is not to be solved by the ministerial path. So that's good. He seemed to be clear there that this is not about women's ordination, women priests, women deacons. So he seemed to rule that out in terms of what his remarks were were, um, were pointing to. So that's good. At least he put that in there. Um, but earlier on, I mean, this is a, a statement he's making about evangelization. And right at the very beginning of those prepared uh, remarks, he says, Today we are called to devote ourselves with all energy of heart and mind to a missionary conversion of the church. And I say, yes, but what does that mean? And let and, and let it just be clear what that means. We need to be in a state of sanctifying grace. Amen. Let us call people to be filled with the life of God that he that Jesus came and died to give us this life in the full. Repent of mortal sin. Come and believe. Go to confession. Get in sanctifying grace. Go receive our Lord in the Holy Eucharist in a state of sanctifying grace. And then let's try to get everybody in the parish in the same state. Let's go out to the neighborhood and try to draw everybody in. This is the missionary evangelization we need right now. Amen. Jim Havens, host of The Simple Truth. God bless you. God love you, my friend. Appreciate you being on the show today. Thank you, Joe. God bless you. Always a pleasure to have Jim on the team and uh, talk about these issues. He's so passionate. That's what I love the most. But that's going to do it for this week. Be sure to be on the email list. Get signed up at thestationofthecross.com forward slash ACT. Sending the insider's email today and goodies are always in the mix. So we'll see you then. God bless you.